by that, I mean, spend a lot of time and effort and energy, a labor of love to sweat over what you're doing to mm-hmm. create the type of story that can stand out because that really translates to the screen. Thank you so much for coming today. Just because I feel like Vogue 73 question is like such an iconic thing. I've seen, I remember I was researching for grad school and like people were doing these like 73 question about each university. They were doing it like just to interview students. And I saw 73 question were just like done by so many internet celebrities like James Charles and a lot of like just like different people were doing their version of it. It's just so impactful. You are the person who created this and then you were the SVP of Content Nest. And I feel like those are just like such an interesting journey that I personally one day want to have, but I don't think I'm creative enough to do something like this, but you're just, so you're just a dream guest for me. I, I really, I really appreciate that. And um, once again, happy to be here and answer any and all types of questions on the really strange and unique journey that I've had. Also like this morning, I was listening to the Boston College YouTube channel and they were like, so basically they brought up a lot of interesting facts. You went a pond champion and you own a restaurant. Well, that the restaurant thing was listed on your website. You own a restaurant in Georgia, yeah, co-own yeah. a restaurant in Georgia. And those are just all interesting facts about you. I would love to learn a little bit more about like how you grew up and how you became you technically. All right. So I guess, I guess I'll get to the puns and, uh, and restaurants. <laughs> after. I'll, I'll yeah. End yeah. Um, well, yeah. I mean, I, I think I think that a lot of who I am is maybe defined mm-hmm. by by what I'm curious by or what I have mm-hmm. been curious by, uh, and a lot of a lot of the things are definitely, you know, to to some people maybe <laughs> strange, mm-hmm. but to me, it's the only thing I know. It really is the only thing I know in my life. Uh, I, I think when you look back at what I was curious by. You would, you would think that a lot of the things are normal for people to be interested in when it comes mm-hmm. to hobbies. Um, but I think for me, that was fueled by a type of fixation and an obsession. But when you think about me like spending uh, hundreds of hours making mazes or forcing myself mm-hmm. to learn Russian or learning every single planet's moon uh, in outer space or every lyric of Bob Marley, I mean, my, my early teenage years are just defined by being so engrossed in these things that I've, I found a curiosity in. Mm. Um, and, and that energy, that, that life source of feeling completely obsessed by something to this day is still a part of me. And mm. I feel lucky when I find it today, because I think it's a little bit fewer and farther between when, when you're discovering the world as a young person, everything uh, provides the opportunity to really create a, a deep interest in, in mm. what it is. But in my earlier years, I, I just kind of look back and I laugh. I, I just must have been so strange uh, to a lot of people. My <laughs> it's a lot of obsession of being into things, um, mm-hmm. and you know, uh, and I think that I, I carry that uh, today. But mm-hmm. I think I think there's also just you know, for a lot of people, they just define it as a life of play, um, mm-hmm. a life where what you're interested by habitats uh, a type of sandbox mm-hmm. to also get good at different skills, you know? Um, and I think ultimately I, I do video now, uh, but I think the broader, the broader theme of what I've, of how I define myself is someone who is, is drawn to ideas and drawn mm-hmm. to the types of ideas that maybe I really haven't seen out there in the world. And that ends up being a really motivating force to, to, to get it done. But you mentioned, you know, you mentioned puns. Yeah, like I'm, I'm the 2007 international pun champion. <laughs> go to Austin, Texas at the 40th annual every <laughs> pun off. And I flew in from California and I showed up and I did a, a pun routine on presidents. And um, I, I'm also very good friends in the country of Georgia where we started a uh, restaurant, uh, an Italian restaurant in the country of Georgia with my best friends, Brian and George. So these are the things that encapsulate who I am. If you add them mm-hmm. all, all together, that is the sum of me, I guess. So were you like the self-educated photographer, like videographer, or like, were you, did you actually took classes on this? I never took classes on it. That was a time where it was conventional, where it was kind of expected you would take classes on it. Now yeah. classes on it. 
think a lot of people would say, well, that's not needed. People are learning how to do this through the success of what they discover on their own time, creating mm -hmm. on YouTube and TikTok. But back then, we got to take you back here. Like this is the year 1999. <laughs> it's like people are listening to Green Day, right? Yeah. Stock just had its 30th, you know, an anniversary uh, disaster. This is a different era, pre Y2K. Everyone thinks the world is going to shut down. So the only camera that you had back then was just a big VHS camcorder where you lugged it on your shoulder and you kind of, you know, you'd have to like edit inside of the tape by pausing and stopping. And it's kind mm -hmm. of a nightmare, right? Yeah. So that's, that's what I learned on. The education was from very much this process that you had to be patient. Mm -hmm. You had, had to be extremely patient in what you're capturing. But the mm -hmm. magic of what you play back when you put a cassette tape in a VCR was something that to this day feels a little bit unparalleled given all the digital blessings that we have. But, um, but I learned via my friends, you know, me and my friends mm -hmm. just doing skits, doing uh, really weird, weird stuff. And then that grew into a little bit more of a sophistication once you learn how to edit video. Mm -hmm. And once you realize you can like play with a little bit more tools uh, in your toolbox mm -hmm. with better technology that came, in, you know, uh, 10 years later. Going back to like the impact in your career, like now we know that, you know, you learn all of these yourself. You had, I think like as a creative, what amazed me about you is you not only did well on your own, you make all these like really crazy genius videos in your own website. Like I saw your website. I was like, oh my God, what is this? A gift collection? I'm just, they're so funny and the creative. And I'm just curious. Like, and then you also did so well in big companies, right? Like in Condé Nast, in HBO. What are like some people that kind of inspire you to take on these like different career route? And do you enjoy being on your own more than like being on um, being in like HBO or like Condé Nast? Or like, do you feel like a combination of both? What did you learn from each of these bucket of work environment? It's, it's, it's a very, it's a, like the past 15 years has been really crazy and I can't believe right. I'm 15 years. Yeah. I graduated college right when YouTube was, was kind of coming into existence. Yeah. I'm, I'm one of the earlier examples of how the internet can change your life for sure. Here I am uploading a, a web show in college mm -hmm. uh, from that same camcorder I got from my dad's closet mm -hmm. with a really talented group of individuals and we're just making stuff and then it had an impact like suddenly the New York Times, suddenly CBS mm -hmm. News. Yeah. We are failing all of my classes as <laughs> media outlets are covering this web show that was created yeah. from the camera, from spending hundreds of hours on iMovie, like killing myself editing this thing, right? So that turned into an opportunity where by spring mm -hmm. break senior year, I knew I was going to be hired by HBO, flying out to Los Angeles, mm -hmm. uh, going, right, going right to Hollywood and starting a digital lab there. Mm -hmm. It was a dream come true, truly. It was an absolute dream to know that you can put something up on the internet. People you can't even see watch it. That creates an effect where, where suddenly I'm, I'm, I, I know what my career is. I yeah. know what I want to do for the rest of my life. I keep on going back to October 13th, 2005. The day where you're in a room with 300 people on your campus, looking at the screen of the latest episode of the thing that you've made. And you look and you say, oh my God, I can do this for the rest of my life. This is an option. Forget about a politician. Mm -hmm. This is what I want to do. And when you're 22 years old and you're excited and you fly out to LA and you're in a corporate mm -hmm. environment, you learn a little bit about the rules of, of being in a corporation. Mm -hmm. You realize that something as innovative as a digital lab at HBO is not exactly making things like The Wire or, uh, or, or The Sopranos, but you're just happy to be there knowing the opportunity is this thing called YouTube. Mm -hmm. Brand new on the scene. What can we do with tight constraints in a company like HBO to try to create some impact? So I had the corporate experience, 2006, 2007. I did that for a couple of years. But then I realized that I had another ability, which was kind of taking footage from, mm -hmm. um, from shows, mainly The Sopranos, which mm -hmm. was owned by H HBO, but then kind of doing this like illicit recap of all of the seasons to help promote the final season. Mm -hmm. season season seven in 2007 so i created mm -hmm. this recap where i put my voice over it i guess that was my first voiceover work before 73 questions and i just did this recap and i'm gonna i'm gonna spare you a really really long story but but by putting this seven minute recap of the sopranos up online was a very foreign thing for companies like 
to just take footage and spoil everything that happened and put it up on YouTube would have mm -hmm. been seen as something disastrous for mm -hmm. me. But I did it anyway. And David Chase, the creator of The Sopranos, loved it. And um, it ended up proving um, a second thing. The first thing, obviously, mm -hmm. was I can do entertainment for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. But uploading a viral remix where you're recapping The Sopranos while working mm -hmm. in operation made me realize I can create things on my own terms, on my own times, and I can make a living doing that as an artist. So mm -hmm. then I left HBO, you know, and I think the next like five years is defined just by making things that I was interested in, things mm -hmm. that can tap into a conversation on the internet, right? And it's still early at this point. Bloggers are still there. It's before algorithms, right? So mm -hmm. if you make things that bloggers like, then suddenly your videos can go viral. And mm -hmm. YouTube was the place to go back then for that, right? So mm -hmm. a lot of my time then in this era as a freelancer is learning how to be self-sufficient, but also making things that I'm curious about realizing that companies would come in and say, I saw that viral thing you, you made. Now I want to pay you to do a different type of thing for us. And that was yeah. the business. So before Condé Nast, working at another corporation a second time, that was my life up until 2014, is really learning through an iterative experimental process of creating things about what makes audiences click on something, what makes audiences share something. And now it comes faster, right? You look at platforms like TikTok, you have, you have, you have preteens at this point who are learning the dynamics and the mechanics of what mm -hmm. makes our own shareable video. Back then it was a little bit more mm -hmm. of a quest in, in figuring it out, but it's, it's crazy thinking back to it, it really is. You know, you created like the HBO lab. What exactly is it? Was it just like you and other people working on a team making these like recap videos or were, was it like more than that? What is it like working for HBO versus Joe making Joe's videos? Yeah, I mean, it was a really special time back then because HBO was willing, and this is all because of Fran Shea, you know, mm -hmm. Ian television veteran and my first boss at HBO to this day, you know, a very significant and important figure in my life. But she had this idea, hey, HBO, what if we just basically went in the basement over here and yeah. exploited a bunch of, uh, you know, kids out of college for basically yeah. no pay, no, health, no health insurance and just let, yeah. them do, let them experiment, let them do mm -hmm. things in their sandbox. Mm -hmm. And that was the pitch. And, you know, HBO obviously had a ton of cash to fund all the stuff that was expensive that you saw that, that everyone knows about, but it was like a little bit of a, a drop in the well for them to finance this lab where we can try things on the internet. Mm -hmm. But the craziest thing thinking back is like going to the comedy festivals. You'd see so many stand up comedians who are so popular now mm -hmm. still climbing that ladder back then in 2006. And I was there like at the Aspen Comedy Festival in, 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 in Las Vegas, uh, just for laughs and, and being just a cameraman, a fly on a wall mm -hmm. watching all the comedians come in. So. I had a really special experience um, mm -hmm. at, digital, at, a, at the lab at HBO, for sure. Speaking of comedy, I actually took classes in at President and Brigade and yeah. Second City. Yeah, I did. And then like I was like the person who would I would like wait in line to see Amy Poehler for free at 9 p.m. My friends and I would grab like a blanket or something to wait in line since like three o'clock. <laughs> Like, I don't know. That was like a really strange experience. And like, it's so fun too. Like, cause I feel like as a person who is like in their late twenties right now, I feel really like old to do that again. But it was like the most interesting experience in my life, speaking of comedy. And so much of it is chemistry, right? Like so much of it is, is trying to get the perfect chemistry between other people on stage. And it's yeah, you can't exactly plan for it, but when it happens, I'm sure you're you're in your best mode, right? Yeah, it's amazing. And speaking of working, because since like I try my best to make it a business podcast, so I'm like out of curiosity on like your work related things, right? Like so either at HBO or at Condé Nast, do you think, do you identify your job as building a team or do you feel like you're more like on the creative side? What were you? And then why I'm asking is like, I'm actually really curious about at these really interesting quote unquote big entertainment empires do you feel like it's like a creative people drives the room or like do you think it's business people drives the room and I constantly think about you know the old model with like all these you know HBO or like content ass I wouldn't say they're an old model but compared to Netflix right Netflix Spotify they're like tech driven platforms sometimes I'm just thinking what's the differences between those two 
type of workplaces. And you, you know, obviously you closely work with YouTube Original, which is, you know, Google, owned by Google, right? Yeah. You probably have ex experience in like all of these places. I'm curious, like where was things and like what's the differences between working at like a tech environment slash tech creative environment versus traditional creative environment? Yeah, it, it, well, it's such a fascinating time right now, right? Because a lot yeah. of companies um, are saying that their platforms, yeah, Spotify and, and YouTube, what a lot of what they're doing is is media, right? Yeah, so, yeah. So for 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 all the all the reasons that that they would say that they're platforms rather than media companies, you know, it comes with a lot of obvious reasons. But at the end of the day, there's still creative people in those companies. Yeah, they're, they're, like you, any company that deals with creatives needs to have creatives inside who can speak that language with creatives outside. Yeah. And that's why these companies have some of the most creative people in the world. Mm -hmm. and, and I think when, when you look at the experience that I've had going, being a part of a team at HBO as a 22 year old, yeah. then I'm trying to do the math on this. And then seven <laughs> years later, running a team at Condé Nast Entertainment, you know, um, th those are different dynamics. I think anyone who's a part of a team or any that, that, that then has to go run a team, there's going to be a lot of difference in that. Right, mm -hmm. a, a lot that comes with that, that, that. That's different. A company like Condé Nast is also different than HBO, right? I mean, mm -hmm. the difference between HBO and Condé Nast is that Condé Nast has a very long legacy mm -hmm. uh, of shaping culture uh, over a century, primarily in the medium of magazines, mm -hmm. right? And each brand, each magazine has, has had its different stewards of sh shaping culture, like unilaterally shaping culture. There was a lot of other things out there that could shape culture mm -hmm. the way that these brands could. And I think that the difference that you have in that environment is that when you're trying to transition to digital and you're trying to take those words and images and translate them into moving images, sight, story, and sound and mm -hmm. video, it comes with a lot of really fascinating, crazy challenges, you know, because at the core of it, my job at Condé Nast Entertainment was to lead a team to develop new IP and new formats and franchises that could mm -hmm. reach new audience that wouldn't normally uh, go to the websites or wouldn't mm -hmm. normally subscribe to the magazines. Try to try to catch all that big big audience on mm -hmm. platforms like YouTube. And at the other end of it, the brands needed their stewards to come and weigh in and say, "What is the DNA of the mm -hmm. stuff that's made?" People like you know Nick Thompson, who was uh, on your on your show, you know, before the Atlantic, he ran Wired. He's an example of a brilliant editor. Who really understood the brand? You know, one of the most creative and smartest guys I've met in my time there. So there's a lot of, more of a balancing act when you have a sandbox in a company like Condé Nast versus the sandbox of HBO Digital Lab. It's two very different DNAs in the company, so it comes with a lot of different navigating. I think like I had a really interesting conversation with Nick. Obviously, Nick is like doing literally my dream job. I wouldn't say like specifically for like a magazine, but it's more like in general. Like I'm such a passionate media person I want to run my own media company well like I'm currently running my own media company but like I currently I want to take it like to like a next level right like Nick has been doing that I feel like one thing I find really interesting was like he is very creative right like he's a the editor-in-chief back in time at Wired and then like he is like this creative genius I'm just curious like how does that translate into management, right? Like being a CEO, it's like such a different job. I think for you as well, your work was like judged by how many people are viewing the videos, right? Like technically, you know, on your website, you listed, you know, you took a, an idea to into like tons of millions of people watching something. And like, those are all number driven results. Curious, like being creative, making stuff that you like is very different than like, making something a billion people will watch like you your numbers beats buzzfeed and like i'm just curious like what is it like like creating something that like goes viral like is there any formula to go viral and do you have your own do you a b test your own product before it goes to market is this like a tech concept or not tech concept like is there like an actual formula like that you use to like making viral content or like do you think it's purely just chemistry, purely just non-explainable, non-scientific stuff. Right. I mean, I think, I think there's, a, there, there's definitely a lot in this. And I think what, when it's impossible to talk about the experience inside of a company like Honey Nest and try right. to stand out. Yeah. And not use as a point of comparison what the current norm is mm -hmm. right now for thousands of people who don't work at companies and corporations. 
you know, I, I, it blows my mind how every year there are more and more people self-sufficiently doing things on their own time, their own terms for mm-hmm. probably less than 50 bucks. That are <laughs> Talking about this podcast, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. This is night 49. I'm just kidding. No, but, but, but you represent a creator culture of people doing things a hundred percent on your own terms and figuring it out and iterating and then having the impact that you want by your own design. And that's mm-hmm. damn inspiring. That inspires me Thank greatly <laughs> and because, because when you think about it, like that, that, that means that there are more people having an impact that can inspire more people themselves to go out and make things. Mm-hmm. And everyone is making things at this point. Everyone is trying to go through the process of making a video that stands out or reaches people. And that act of doing that improves so many <laughs> skills in, 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 in storytelling and technical ability. The reason I bring that up is because when you're in a company like Condé Nast or any other media company, there, there's rules, you know, like there are real parameters. There are real constraints. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we, you know, a company like Condé Nast is probably going to get access to celebrities more often than, you know, some person making me. <laughs> <laughs> or, no, no, but you, I mean, you are getting celebrities at this point. <laughs> crazy. But, um, but, but I think that there, there's a little bit of a try to figure out how to come up with a formula, knowing that the constraints are different, knowing that a, like you may get access to a celebrity, but it may only be for 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. And the type of concept you make needs to check the boxes for the brand that yeah. the celebrity is coming to shoot for. It also needs to be something that is um, that is going to uh, work on a specific platform because that's the, biz- the, the business model is that you're going to prioritize different platforms more than others based on the way that ads run, right? So there's right. all kind of rules and there's things to be mindful of with the constraints that you have, mm-hmm. which is different working creatively in a corporation. But I guess the thing that links those two worlds is media companies that get this right will ultimately trust and give freedom to those creators in the trenches, those, those people showing up at the right call time on the call sheet, you know, those people yelling action on set, those people spending hours and hours working with an editor just, just to get it right. There's going to be autonomy for those creators to do what they need to do mm-hmm. to effectively make the type of video that can reach reach a massive audience. And I think that's the consistent streak in these companies is that freedom for creators to do what they need to do and figure out what they need to figure out is, is the ultimate um, condition uh, by which success can, can grow from. So freedom in sandboxes, that is the theme of this podcast episode for sure. <laughs> did you build your team at Condé Nast? Like, did you select who to go on your team? Or did you just like run with whoever you have? Because after having a little bit experience of running a small company, I feel like it's extremely tough to like, you know, you have to consider about the budget, you have to consider like, you know, even you want to hire your competitor, but you're like afraid of like, they're gonna like, fail you or something like in between you. And then there's other stuff, for example, from when I was hiring my own intern I love her like I feel like I've seen different resumes right like there's like the creative genius I talk with people that are like oh my god they're like the most creative people I've met but like I I can tell they're really really hard to manage and on the other hand there's like really nice people who can actually execute who can actually be on time put work together but they're not as creative how do you kind of balance it out to like actually create a team that's like functional as well as like <laughs> like they're not going to clash all the time i think that the the, the first uh, precondition to having someone be a part of a team at a, at a place like kind entertainment is that they want to be there day in and day out yeah like they want to have a desk they want to have a laptop and they want to be in the rooms and they want to be making things mm-hmm. and i say that because that's different than freelance life Mm-hmm. That's different than maybe hopping on for one assignment, leaving, having multiple clients. Mm-hmm. So I think like that, that is something that someone wants to do is to create videos exclusively for one place. Now, Condé Nast is amazing because there's all these different brands and, uh, you know, you can basically pick any subject under the sun and it'll probably be covered thematically by one mm-hmm. of the brands at Condé Nast, which made it such a great place to work. Um, but I think that that's the first thing is, is, is dis- disposition. And then the second thing is just kind of like figuring out, okay, like you may come in thinking that you want 
to just produce a video, but then you realize that you're good at directing, you're good at dealing with talent on camera. And then, mm -hmm. and then and having the chance to kind of maybe shift towards that based on what you 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 see as being uh, good for you, right? Or mm -hmm. sometimes it's it's management, you know, sometimes it's the person responsible for for uh, for assigning the directors and the producers from a managerial standpoint. Sometimes it's people that love dealing with talent and reaching out to different experts who can be on camera, who can who can uh, who can be featured by by one of the videos that we have. So there's all of these different skill sets because the chain in production has a lot of links. When you generate an idea, it needs to be shaped. Booking and casting needs to go against it to imagine the right people on camera for it. You need to set up the shoot for it. You need to do the art art design and then you need to shoot it and then it goes in the post. There's all of these different things. And that's what I love about production is that this isn't just about like being on camera yelling action. There's so many other things that go involved that that, that go and are involved in making mm -hmm. successful videos. So I would say that uh, the team that was built over time, um, mm -hmm. obviously like the, the best in the world at what they did and the, the broader company, like all of Condé Nast Entertainment got so good over the years in figuring out what, um, how it can be a, a more better and, and perfect organization at making videos that, that, that captured audience. Mm -hmm. And I would say that it became that way more through the success of what we've made than mm -hmm. anything else. It's it's one thing to kind of just have um, words and 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 vision documents, but it's another just to simply make things, have it go out in the world, and then you debrief mm -hmm. and learn from what you've made, and that ends up shaping the vision more than anything else. Mm. I, I think that 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 is a key key thing that I've learned. Having then, a vision, ha having a vision through the expression of the things that you make. Mm. You know? And I think like I love this. It. This goes to you, for example, right? Like you may have set out thinking that the, your mission and vision was one thing. Yeah. When I ask you, like, did it get refined over time? The totally. more that you've done it, and then you see the the feedback that you get. I feel like I have so much admiration for you. I feel like you kind of put up two different. You created like two different. Well, like you're really amazing at like two different things, right? Like a is like, you are a creative genius. Like you have these concepts in your mind, and then you can you're able to translate that into an artwork. And you're relentless about like making the detail happen, making like everything happen. I saw like, even like I saw like a cringy video from seven years ago, you made about your back in time, your startup. It's like a video startup that like you're telling stories. At, like there's women singing, I wouldn't say opera. I don't know what, oh, like not opera. Like she was singing a song and then telling a story and stuff like that. And you're a creative genius. Like you can actually put this into an art. And then on the other hand, you are able to, manage other people like you know working at Con S, like managing artistic people I feel like it's extremely tough and as well as like you created your own business like just reading from like online I feel like you know creating a business I feel like it needs your your own like you know business manager like biz dev like you have to like contact your own contacts from like I don't know YouTube or something and there's like you have to on the other hand, you have to actually make these videos, right? I feel like those are like two part of work using two different brains. Yeah. I just feel like it's hard. It's like, oh my God, like every day you have to think about like, should I, how should I like approach the revenue side of things? Or should I get more fuller for, first? Or like, should I get like more revenue first? So I can, you know, have the budget to do high production or like to actually hire intern to run social media. Those are just such different game. I'm amazed by like how you run your own thing. Well, I would just say, I think for anyone in any position where it feels like they're they're doing more than one skill set, yeah. know the hats that you wear on your head. Like how many hats are you wearing and know them really, really well. And there's gonna be a time, like in a kind of nest, I was wearing two hats. I was a manager of a team of 30 people and I was also uh, more a hands-on maker, like yeah. on set, making things with my own hands. And then I'd go back to my office and then I'd, I'd help in whatever way I could shape the creative of the people on my team, right? And, and mm -hmm. encouraging them and, and, and steering and guiding as a leader. So those are two very, very different hats. One, yeah. is, hands -on, one is hands on in a different way because it involves translating a little bit of vision and expertise through other creators where they're finding the things that they, they can make that can have impact. So two hats are on my head. And I think after a while, when, when, when you're in that mode for six years, I think for me, because I had gone from HBO to five years on my own, now to a corporation for six years wearing those mm -hmm. two hats, I said, you know, what? I'm ready to kind of take off that that hat of running a team in, in, in a company. 
Mm -hmm. I'm ready to just dive back into that world that was familiar to me before, that life where I was kind of working out of cafes and hustling to find clients and throwing myself onto different things. So that's why I left Condé Nast and to start my own studio, so Studio Sabia. Uh, mm -hmm. And now, now, now everything feels so much more hands-on. I'm back to those roots uh, of being an artist and a creator. So that, that's kind of where I am in starting my own company right now. And it feels great. I'm so excited to be on the other side. Now, will I go back to that side again in a company where I'm managing in the future? Possibly, but for now it feels right. And I think people just need to know where they are, what hats they wear, what hats are missing, how to develop hat making skills to put something else on your head later. Yeah. And kind of kind of do whatever it you can to just work towards what feels like a great space for you. That's yeah. And we can all do. You mentioned such a great point, developing the hat making skills, right? Like how do you develop that for you? On the other hand, on the management side or like on the biz dev side, how do you maintain the relationship? I feel like it's such a black box on like how people reach out to other people. How do they stay in touch? I think I'm great at reaching out, but like staying in touch, like depends on like your chemistry with a person, right? I'm like, also, I don't want to be non-organic, but I also feel like there's definitely people out there that are doing amazing job, way more better than me. So I'm like curious. I feel like you're one of those people, a thousand percent, like you're such a people person. So I'm curious, like, how do you learn the yeah. hat making skills? Staying in touch with people is really important. And yeah. I think in the end, um, be as kind as you can, be as yeah. supportive of other mm -hmm. people, especially if you're an artist, if you're a creator, be supportive of other artists and creators. Yeah. Help, give them opportunities, right? These are things that I think about all the time. Um, there's uh, a man named Fred Seibert who's responsible for, uh, for designing the MTV logo. Mm -hmm. he, I'll never forget years ago, I was at a breakfast with him at like eight o'clock in the morning at some restaurant and he goes, Joe, do you know every morning at eight o'clock I'm sitting at this table with someone new across from me? And I thought that was so amazing that he made the time to, to have genuine conversations with people where he's not looking for things out of it. He just wants to have great conversations with people in the same way that you want to have great conversations with people. But that like rigor and that regimentation <laughs> and that discipline to like to book one person every single day will ultimately have its have its great dividends. And being in the mix with, with all these different people, with feeling like you have your fingers on the pulse of all these different things that are going on, the inspiration that comes with it. So I think ultimately this really comes down to if, if you are going to be the type that's going to dedicate one, one hour a week of exercise, or you're going to run every morning, or you're going to say, you know what, there's going to be a couple of days a week where I'm not drinking alcohol. You should consider applying the same discipline for, for having a conversation with someone. And I wow. think that I look at, I look at what, what you do and you, you've turned it into a podcast, but not everyone needs to turn this into a podcast, right? Like you just have to put it in the calendar. You have to do the work because I believe that talking to people is the biggest source of inspiration you can possibly have. Would you agree? I agree. I actually have a question for you though. So for, for like our conversation, of course, I like been, you know, following you over years, like on the social media or like on, you know, media. And I had to sit down, like, I feel like I got a lot of information out of just researching you, right? Like just like by, by researching, I don't mean like actually stalking or whatever, but it's like literally you're, you're over the internet. I feel like I, for his strategy, I like, I can foresee a problem, which is you just have a superficial conversation with everyone every morning, right? Like, I mean, I think he does that in a really good way. Like, I think like he's a genius in that way, like schedule something. And then like, be committed. That's better than you are sitting at your home every day. But like I have to have a meaningful conversation. You really have to like research the f out of a person and then you have to respect their time. And my approach is to really like dive deep into like what this person have done. I'm not saying like I memorize all your life detail, like where you're born or something. At this point, I like, I know you were born from Connecticut, I guess, but like, right. <laughs> yes. I'm just like, okay. So I think my thought is just, I think definitely have a conversation with as many people as possible. But I also, I think the depth of the conversation only come from your research. It, it comes from, yes. I think like what you're doing is that you were having conversations for posterity. Like these are uploaded and live for <laughs> all eternity for people to come in and get inspired by what your guests are saying. But in a private conversation, when you're just on, maybe on Zoom with someone for an hour, what motivates you to have that conversation? It needs to be genuine. It needs to be 
a real curiosity of why you would want to talk with someone or reach out yeah. to them, especially if they don't know you. Reconnecting with people is one thing, but if someone's never heard from you, what what can you do to reach out to them that shows a genuine interest in what they're doing, but a specific one? Because there's a huge difference between I want to pick your brain and I really want to get into the motivation of why you created that one thing in your life. Mm. And sometimes that, that specificity on one thing leads to a beautifully uh, deep conversation. I think it, the kernel of it and the, the theme to everything here is curiosity and what drives you, what motivates you, what do you want to learn? What do you feel obsessed by? Go back to who you were as a 13, 14, 15 year old and think very, very like clearly about what you were obsessed with back then because chances are that there's still a flame of that inside of you now. Mm. And the coolest thing about now as adults is that we know more people, we have more life experiences, mm-hmm. right? We have more of an ability to nurture that flame that's inside of us now more be- better than any other time in our mm-hmm. lives. So that, that really, really, you know, drives me. I love like the romantic side of it. Like it's super, you know, the serendipity, like, you know, you are learning every day and like, I love all that. I'm curious, like as a creative person, like how do that, how do you turn that into a revenue stream, right? Like this is like the unsexy part of the whole conversation. As a creative person, sure, we could be creative and then creative, create something that we like to watch. And like, A, how do you make sure that other people want to watch. And then the other part is what does that translate into the money side of things? How, at what point should we think about like, oh, let, should we focus on the, the follower first or should we focus on like the money first? Because I hear these like conflicted opinion by different people. I personally feel like if you don't have great content, you would not have follower or yeah. money. And I also saw other people preach the opposite which also seemingly are true like if you don't have money you don't have the money to spend on making good content so I'm like really conflicted I I have been always a first believer like I believe in the content first and then like money comes later and like what's your belief I mean it depends on what you want to build right right if you want to build something that costs a lot of money up front then it becomes a business (laughs) thing before a making thing yeah Sometimes you can make something as a prototype and then show people to give you money, which becomes a business yeah, thing. The startup <laughs> approach. <laughs> startup. But for, but for what, I mean, what are we talking about here? What are we making? What are we building? If it's a podcast, if it's videos, if it's, if it's all of these things that we can so more easily do for cheap than any other time in history, then at the core of it, you better, you better love what you're interested in. Yeah. <laughs> It is a long journey to get to where, you know, it can be a long journey to, to getting to where you're eventually, you know. At Joe Rogan. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, that, that, yeah, yeah. It's a long road to, to getting paid $100 million by, by Spotify. But, but I guess when it comes to just making any money, getting paid in any sort of way, whether through an advertiser or whether through $5 tips on Patreon, I think ultimately, what are you making that you will, that you are not just in love with, but you will stay in love with knowing that like love, it, it evolves over time. But at the end of the day, like you need to, you need to wake up in the morning excited by what you're doing. Now, if you have a full-time job somewhere else, the best thing you can do is do whatever it takes to just start with a portion of your pie in the pie chart, you know, fueling the thing that you love in the simplest way possible. I always tell people, mm-hmm. do not spend a lot of time thinking about how to create your first episode of something. Yeah. Right. Because it's easier to start simple and strip down and then make it heavier than it is to start really, really heavy. You realize no one watched it and then you're disappointed because, <laughs> oh my God, it's way too much. Welcome to my life. <laughs> but the podcasts are so brilliant because it, there, there's a lightweight uh, uh, lift to, to, to the execution of the, of, the, of the podcast itself. So that's kind of a good good example of what works. And I'd also tell people too, knowing that everyone ultimately wants to get paid for what they want to do. But I think a lot of it is about expectations. You know, I always, I always said at Conde, um, before every format, you have an experiment not trying to be a format. Mm. I guess what that means is, you know, what, what, what could just be a standard race ends up turning into a three, three-legged race if you're consumed by the idea that what you're making needs to make money. And I think it's much more of an organic thing to just try to get a few people 
loving what you're making as much as you. Because that tends to evolve in a way, knowing that you're going to get better at what you're doing. That's what um, I think, uh, I think it was Ira Glass who said that. Like your, your job is, is to just do what you love, knowing that by the act of doing it over and over again, you're gonna get less bad at it. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. Uh, and if people share a point of view or they're curious by your point of view, yeah. then ultimately the money follows that. Mm -hmm. Now maybe five bucks, it may be a hundred million, but ultimately money will follow that. What drives you to keep making these videos? And like, what's your like best outcome after creating your own? What is your vision for your own studio? So my, my vision right now is to simply gravitate towards opportunities given by people who I respect, who mm -hmm. I really appreciate as human beings, and just being able to collaborate with them on the different things that pop up based mm -hmm. on what they can offer as an opportunity. And I think that that, that, that is kind of like what you would see mm -hmm. when it comes to the offering of Studio Savia is mm -hmm. I'm just here to make things with you, right? Mm -hmm. I'm here to leverage a lot of experience, a point of view, a creative point of view into mm -hmm. making videos, into creating st strategic campaigns for creating types of videos that can build audience for you, to being uh, my own production company at this point where uh, we can actually go in soup to nuts and produce these things. But that's not just a one-way street though of, of the engagement coming from, from people you know, um, looking to hire me. It's also the ability for me to reach out to people who I love working with and mm -hmm. say, hey, do you wanna hop on this project that's, that, that's, that's in my corner right now? Or, hey, there's this side project that has nothing to do with, with a client or money. It's just mm -hmm. really cool and interesting and let's spend a Saturday afternoon making it. So life right now feels more of a complete sandbox in this way. And I think that mm -hmm. that's where I want to be, where I'm just around people who I enjoy spending my time with on things that, that drive me. And also yeah. too, let me just say one other thing is I think being inspired by what other people are making mm -hmm. is one of the best catalysts for, for creating. As we speak, I have, uh, you know, I have friends who are doing magnificent things that they are consumed by, whether it's my friend Nare, this incredible pianist, you know, she's learning a uh, classical musician's take on mm -hmm. learning flamenco and she's discovering that music and going through the journey of figuring out how to create piano music for flamenco or my buddy Aaron Rasmussen um, is inventing things in his garage. Uh, you know, th they are making videos and putting them out, the, uh, out there to the world because that's who they need to be. Mm -hmm. They're consumed by it. And I think that the effect that that has for other creators to watch other creators create while they're in the zone. <laughs> in the zone. In the zone, they're, they're consumed by it, is the best energy you can feed off of. Because it makes you want to wake up early the next morning and say, it's time to get shit done. What inspires you though? The back to the media diet thing. So like, do you watch like, what, what's your favorite movie or oh, yeah. like books or something? Forgot that. Um, I'm all about docs right now. I'm just trying to watch as many documentaries as possible. Wait, wait, what documentary? Uh, doc I mean, I've been watching a lot of documentaries. I just watched one on Val Kilmer, on um, on Frank Zappa. Like, oh my God, what a, what a musical genius he was. Um, to um, uh, Mike Wallace. Uh, my buddy Chris created this uh, Mike Wallace documentary to Apollo 11, the first landing on the moon. Oh my God, there's a doc for everything everything at this point. It's a great way to learn. That's interesting. I would imagine you watch like, I don't know, Woody Allen or something, but like, it seems like it's like opposite. Like, I think I would watch Woody Allen. What? I don't know. Like the vibe, like <laughs> your background. I like Woody Allen. I mean, oh, I don't like him personally. Like, I don't like his like scandal part, but like, I like the movies that he have made, right? Like, it's very interesting. No, but, but I, but I think docs, because like, cause I, I actually may be directing my first documentary soon, knock on wood. So I'm trying to like really see, when, I'm trying I, to see how, <laughs> how all the different approaches to documentary making as a craft, all the different ways to merge basically factual historical storytelling and journalism with incredibly bold aesthetic and artistic choices. And I think that's why the medium is so interesting is that it's not just about getting someone to re reveal, you know, the, the compelling statement. Yeah. It, it, so about like, how do I shoot it in a cool way that's different than all the other docs that are out there? So that's why docs are, are really fascinating to me. Do you take notes when you're watching these things? Like, do you 
just got inspired like organically and for all these creative things that you've made right like with celebrities like I I was literally like yesterday I was watching the one that you made for like Blackpink I'm curious like what were your inspirations like do you come up with like these ideas in the shower and then you instantly type them into your phone note or like do you keep a little notebook how do you make sure you capture your ideas and are those like manufactured as in your head, such as like today on my Excel sheet, I have like 16 different clients. Like for this client, let's watch like what they have in the past. Let's say you are developing a campaign for, let's say Tom's shoes. Uh, you're like, oh, let me just watch like 50 other shoe videos from the seventies or like, and then this is like it. How did that turn into like some actual product? I, I, I think, I think you, you want to, you want to really understand the brand or the mission or the brief. Yeah. Uh, research, just like you do research for this podcast. I mean, anytime there's a creative challenge, you really want to do your homework. Right. You, you want to see as much as you can that goes back that informs new ideas. You, you also want to understand the tone that comes with, with who someone is as a brand by, by watching everything they've done in the past. Right. You want to, you want to maybe get some references from clients about what they're aiming to do. Right, you know, every now and then, everyone is always going to send a video of the history of John Baldessari by Supermarché. This is an incredible artist named John Baldessari, and it's one of the most like iconic, you know, ways to create a short doc documentary of someone. Mm -hmm. And I think when 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 you see people hold up examples of of who they of what they want to make for their own brand, I think references are really powerful because it says so much about style. It says so much about their daringness to maybe mm -hmm. do something that's innovative and bold. So I love it when, when there's references that I identify with creatively coming my way, because it means that I have latitude and freedom in the sandbox mm -hmm. to kind of go and make something that can really resonate uh, for them as well. But then when, it, when you get into it, organizing ideas, yeah. I mean, a lot of it comes down to notes, spreadsheets, and organized thoughts. I think the, the best way for me to brainstorm, other than having really great conversations where you're with people you creatively respect and you say, we only have one hour to come up with something. Sometimes it's just like really helpful to come up with ideas. Other, other, other times it's the discipline of focus. The discipline mm -hmm. that says, I'm not gonna get distracted by going to dig.com and watching the latest viral videos, or I'm not going to get caught up in anything else, but sit here and figure out great ideas for things. And I think that's what I may need improvement on. I think a lot of people need improvement on that discipline. We're all torn in so many directions these days. But that's that's something that I think is often the best because you're not depending on anyone else. You're just there with your own storytelling experiences, trying to come up with something that feels new and inspiring yourself. That's it. For example, when you're shooting the videos that you've made for these brands, how do you, do you sit there? Like, do you have like a spread? Well, not spreadsheet, but like, do you have like a word document? You would say, oh, I think the core brand of YouTube original is how we differentiate YouTube original with Netflix. And like, do you write these creative concepts on a doc or like, is this like just today, my end of day's goal is to like, just come up with like, a new video series for like YouTube original. This is like 50 people that I know among all the celebrities that I've worked with. And this is like how realistic to invite maybe Kim Kardashian instead of Kylie Jenner. What's your process? It, I think it just depends on the opportunity that they have. You know, there are some companies right now, like, you know, Amazon Audible right now, um, uh, we're working with them to basically say, okay, what can we do with their celebrities that are coming in to promote their uh, audiobook titles, right? So just like Condé Nast Entertainment, you have these celebrities coming in that are there to promote and mm -hmm. you have a certain amount of time with them. You have to try to come up with ideas that can that can be good for the brand and reach some audience to help promote the audiobook. Yeah. So that's an example of where access is already kind of predetermined based on a schedule of all the different mm -hmm. things that are coming up. So that activity is very much one after another. Okay, this celebrity is coming up. All right, this celebrity is coming up. What should we do with them? What should we do with them? We try to, you know, very much, and this is kind of what we did at Condé for so long, is really think about the core appeal of this celebrity, to really research what they've done, to try to also be selective and not, not just try to go with any celebrity, you know, try to go for the type of celebrity who can get audience, because at the end of the day, we want these ideas to be seen. So I think there's a lot of that research that goes in to inform a sense of what type of bet to place on an mm. idea. So that activity 
is very much like Conde and it's still going on with a client like Amazon right now. But, um, but then there's other things too that are a little bit more specific, you know? Um, I'm thinking very much of my very dear friend. His name is Alex Gray. He's running for Boston at large city council. Mm-hmm. And I ran with him uh, for president and vice president as vice president of uh, Boston mm-hmm. College our sophomore year. Yeah. And um, he's also going to be the, the first, uh, I think he's one of the first blind candidates for city council in, in America. And that brief of, hey, Joe, do you want to like team up to make a campaign video mm-hmm. <laughs> is personally, you know, very rewarding work because it allows me to reconnect with an old friend and to help make a substantive campaign, you know, video that can, that can maybe help him get elected. So that brief's different, right? There's much more of a, of a, of a need to be tonally accurate in what you're doing um, to make sure that the message is there. It's very clear, very concise. And the audience there is Boston. It's not exactly any, any other people other than voters in Boston. So very different things there as examples. When it comes to brands, you know, Tom's or Google or like Amazon Audible, like they're so freaking different, right? Like they couldn't be more different from each other, like from brand identity to what they're trying to do and like the product they're trying to sell. What's your process to understand behind the brand besides like, you know, chatting with a founder for like an hour to get their founder story, maybe not, or like chatting with a PR team to like for an hour, they're like, we want, we want these lines to come across. But as a creative person, do you just default agree with whatever they're saying because they're paying, right? Or do you feel like you have, you're obligated to do go beyond that because you're such a great artist to like understand what they're trying to do, like from a business perspective, right? I, I understand that companies are businesses trying to make money. Right. That ultimately funds all the creative work that can happen to then make more money. I guess. <laughs> but I don't, I don't really think about it that much. Right. There. But I think the, the, the beauty of being a creator is that you just think about what you're creating. And, you know, I, I referenced before the, I, the, the, when, when a client comes and says, Hey, we really like something like this. And then that gives you a sense of their daringness. I think what, what I've, I've been able to uh, kind of enjoy in the position I'm in are a lot of people who've held up something like 73 questions as a reference of what they want to make in another campaign. Yeah. But when the, the guy who does 73 questions is there as a creator saying, okay, uh, you're here because you're looking for something that maybe is a reinvention. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Of, of something you've done normally in the past, or you're looking mm-hmm. to be a little bit more experimental mm-hmm. in the way that your concepts stand out. I think that it kind of gives me a little bit of license and permission to be able to be daring with the ideas that I want mm-hmm. to do because they're expecting it from me, mm-hmm. right? So I think that, that that says so much about companies when you're enlisting specific people with specific track records is mm-hmm. that you're going to get that type of work. And I, I would only want to do the type of work that that can stand out or it can be different. And I, of course, I'm going to fight very, very hard to say, mm-hmm. you have to trust the execution of this is going to get more people to watch this than the execution of that. Mm. That trust is everything. And I think the best relationships are with clients where that trust is really there, where we're all holding hands about to jump in a cliff together and saying, look, this is, this is the best version of what we can do together. And we have to trust that it is. Is every art or media just gonna be like an advertising process for everybody just because i feel like nowadays every company is a media company right because everyone if you want to get yourself out there it's like never it's never going to be like a one commercial thing anymore it's going to be like a media empire building journey for everybody imagine if you're like nike from nike to google like everyone is trying to get eyeballs on everything media is like such a great property and how should a startup build a like, I'm just asking this because I live in Silicon Valley, right? Like every startup is trying to tell their own story or like get themselves out there. Like, what is the best way to tell your own story? And what do you foresee in the future? Like media property is like for the society, just because right now it's like us, like, you know, like you are media entrepreneur. I'm a media entrepreneur. I feel like right now we need to like identify who is our client. And then essentially we have to sell ourselves to the client and like, make things for them. And that's like the way of us monetizing things. What is a future for that? There's like just two parts of the question. One part is like, as a 
smaller brand as a startup or something? How do you tell your own story? And the other part is as a creators, as creators, like how should we like think about like monetization or like think about like if one day you want to be an empire, like what are things that you should be doing? Yeah, well, I think I think a lot about like what what companies right now. I mean, it's never been easier to start a company. It's never been easier, I think, like to get funding to kind of grow a company. It feels like. Knock on wood. Let's hope that that does last, given the economy and all that. But I think that's just another thing that's going on, which is so interesting, is that people with audiences seem to have a lot more leverage these days than any other time on earth. Yeah. What I mean by that is, you know, all the way from these massive traditional stars like LeBron James, Reese Witherspoon, Ryan Reynolds, mm-hmm. like they they basically, you know, you can almost imagine someone whispering in their ear, "Hey, if you like keep doing this like media company thing." there's going to be massive impact and it can be really, really lucrative. And I think Mm -hmm. there's a light bulb moment. I think like the the earliest evidence of this may be like Ashton Kutcher, you know, like investing in a bunch of startups, but now it feels like if you're, if you're someone who has a massive audience and you're not (laughs) creating some sort of media entity that's driven by a CEO and a team of people that you're responsible for as, you know, as, as working for you, um, it seems like you're squandering an opportunity a big opportunity to have impact and, and make some cash. So I only see celebrities as just getting more and more influential and important. I see them needing traditional media companies less and less when you think about it, mm-hmm. right? If you can go directly to your audience on hundred million followers on Instagram, why do you really need so much a brand that's not personified, you know, um, telling your story or putting it through a filter? Mm-hmm. A lot of celebrities that's risky. Like I don't, you know, a lot of people don't really need that anymore when they can go right to their audience. So I just, I see celebrities as being more and more influential and, and starting all sorts of companies moving ahead. For anyone who's not a celebrity or not growing their own audience, but they want to figure out, okay, like, what can we do to tell our story? I think first, you know, be, be true to who you are. Uh, <laughs> don't look at someone else's playbook and say, if we just scan it and, and this is ours and we'll have the same effect. But there's too many copycats out there. It just doesn't make sense. So I, have, I would just suggest, what is it about your story that may be superlatively interesting mm-hmm. or intriguing or stand out? You know, does it come with this really obscure um, inspiration that's decades old? Does it come with some unique struggle? Uh, or does it come with some enlightenment as to why the founder came up with the idea? There's all of this really motivating stuff that's there. And then it comes down to, you know, craft something that has a reason to exist outside of the company you know make something for people who have never heard of you not just never heard of you never heard of the product you're trying to sell like like get them to understand what you're doing and i think some of the best classic examples of that are often done in conditions where people really aren't spending a lot of money on this they're not paying for some slick advertising agency to come in and create something shiny they're just spending a lot of time with rolling up their, their sleeves and just doing something creative, whether it's Dollar Shave Club coming up with a ridiculous, you know, kind of commercial for, for what their dollar razors are. Or I, I always go back to um, a mattress company. You know, they have a warehouse full of mattresses. Well, why don't we, they said, why don't we create the world, the Guinness World Book of Records of mattress dominoes where they just lined up all the mattresses and they <laughs> fell one after another and they broke the Guinness World Record. Or, you know, there's like a, a startup that helps with floor plans. Mad Men, the TV show Mad Men was a big thing and the office there is so iconic. Mm-hmm. This company just decided to do the floor plans for Mad Men. <laughs> like you're actually looking at floor plans that had never been done before. And that was a great way to advertise that company. Mm-hmm. So I think there's so much about effort. And I've said for a long time, you know, you can you can spend to amaze mm-hmm. you a lot of money. If you have a huge marketing budget, you better spend it in a way that blows people's minds. Mm-hmm. But if you can't spend to amaze, sweat to amaze. And by that, by, by that, I mean, spend a lot of time and effort and energy, a labor of love to sweat over what you're doing to mm-hmm. create the type of story that can stand out because that really translates to the screen. Mm-hmm. And some, some of these examples I give are, just pure authentic admiration from audiences saying this was a really great way to tell a story. And I think startups that do that um, effectively are ones where they're really effing excited and willing to spend a lot of time to make it. 
I love like all the examples that you said. Like I want to. I mean, after this, I'm gonna watch like the mattress domino thing. <laughs> Ridiculous, yeah. Oh my god, that sounds ridiculous. But like, I would love to. Like, just I don't know. I would. That's something I would definitely want to watch. You're so right. As a regular person, is there like what's the best way to build their brand? Is that like growing TikTok? Isn't everything growing TikTok at at this point?、Uh, <laughs> yeah, of course, the answer is grow TikTok. What are you doing? You don't, guys. You don't have a TikTok channel. I need to have one today. I'm creating one. Good.、You、better develop that TikTok strategy. Stat. I'm gonna do the quick seventy-three question for you. What's your favorite book? I'm looking at the I, I, honestly the the three-part series on Franz Liszt. You can tell I'm a huge Franz Liszt fan. So I would say the literature on Franz Liszt is my favorite book. Yeah.、Uh, what's your favorite color? Blue. Who made the biggest impact in your career?、Uh, probably my first boss, Fran, who I mentioned at HBO. Where can we find you outside of work? Running every morning. I run every morning now. You'll find me running on the street.、Uh, what's your favorite painting behind you? It'd probably be this. This is my my friend Phil Folino who drew my hometown. There's like a little waterfall and like a city hall. A Love、hall. it. Love it. Connecticut. Connecticut. What's your favorite part about Connecticut? Favorite part about Connecticut? The memories there. Who is your favorite childhood friend? Childhood friend? Oh my god! Now you're making me pick and choose. Here I am going to a bachelor party of my my childhood friend, and he's bringing like 18 of us. So I would say all all 18 of them are my favorite childhood friend. What's your favorite food? Uh, probably uh, lasagna or anything Italian. Sarah Jessica Parker or Kim Kardashian. I enjoyed my time with Sarah Jessica Parker. I can imagine speaking for hours. After you interview Sarah Jessica Parker, have you ever watched Sex and City? I think I watched three episodes after. <laughs> what What's your favorite part about New York? Serendipity. There's、what's, nothing I enjoy more than bumping into a familiar face and it feels like magic. Do you like the Devil Wears Prada? I love that movie. Shooting Emily Blunt, we did a, a parody of it years later with Emily Blunt going through the Vogue offices for seventy three questions, and I love that movie. Who doesn't love that movie? There's <laughs> like a Shakespearean drama. Seriously,、um, yeah. Do you have any pets? I have a beloved. My, my parents have a beloved dog named Gus, eighteen years old. God bless his soul. But I don't have any pets other than these plants. I got、mm-hmm. plants. So I, I you got plants.、Um, who take care of the plants? Is that you or someone else? Who takes? Of course, I take care of the plants. What's your favorite coffee shop? My own French press. What's your favorite coffee flavor? <laughs> or like, what's your favorite Starbucks Starbucks order? Let's do a Starbucks order. Favorite Starbucks order is I don't I don't I don't go to Starbucks so much, but like a favorite coffee order, I I, I just get、uh, coffee and milk. I've never I, I made the great great decision to never get addicted to sugar. I've never had sugar in my coffee. This is coffee and milk. Good. Look at we're two coffee drinkers who are like. Okay, what's your favorite tech company? Favorite tech company. Oh, okay. I would say Outlier, <laughs> Outlier dot org, from the founder of Masterclass creates Outlier dot org, which is basically Masterclass quality video for higher education and credits. Hmm. That and a company called Tonebase, which is basically the Masterclass model for classical piano and classical guitar. Man, I love Masterclass too. What's your favorite drink? Uh, favorite drink would be a, a, a Russian, a white Russian. A white Russian. I like white Russian. I drink that in the summer, like milk, milk with ice. Yeah, it's basically the drink version of the coffee milk thing. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite sports? Favorite sport? Probably watching soccer, football or soccer. Or watching different countries play each other. I, I really love that. Who is like your favorite celebrity to work with? Oh, that is tough, right? That's a that's a tough one. It's a savage、um, one. It's like, who do you say at this point? I always go back to the usual suspects, you know, Roger Federer, Emma、What? Stone, Emma, Emma Stone, yeah, Emma Stone. A lot of magical, magical, amazing people who、um, I've interviewed, and the the list is way too long to to mention. This is actually not seventy three question anymore. Thank you. This is really great. Thank you so much, Joe.